I want to put on the board tonight is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. Verse 22. We want to talk about sanctification and what it means to be in Christ and not in Adam anymore. Because our identification, now our identification needs to identify that we are in Christ and we're not in Adam anymore. We died to Adam, Adam died, and we've been made alive in Christ. So every one of us here today that has received Christ as our personal Savior, we are in Christ. God put us in Christ, and what He is, we are, okay? And so let's read that scripture. For just as because of their union of nature in Adam, in animal, <laughs> that's a good one. In Adam, all people died. Now let's, let's make sure we get that in our mind. For just as, or because of their union, or because of our union now, our union of, which is in, by nature, in Adam, all people died. So isn't that good news? We don't have to identify with him no more because we died in Adam. So also, so also, by virtue of their union of nature, shall all in Christ, underline in Christ, be made alive. So we died in Christ, and God made us alive in Christ. Okay? Now you just have to accept that by faith. Everybody say, I am alive. In Christ. All right. That's very important to see. Now, <clears throat> the other scripture that I want to share right now is 1 Corinthians 1.30. So turn to 1.30 on the board, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Put the King James up there first on that one. If you don't mind, uh, Charles, King James first. It's smaller, interpacked. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. But of God are ye in Christ Jesus. God put us in Christ Jesus. Everybody see that? But of him, but of God are ye in Christ Jesus. Because of God, God put us in Christ Jesus. We died in Adam and we've been made alive in Christ Jesus. That's our new identification. Let me read that uh, uh, further on. Who of God is made unto us, in other words, God made unto us, in other words, God made Christ unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Everybody see that? All right, let's go over that again. But of God are ye in Christ. How did I get in Christ? God put us in Christ. Okay? When did that happen? Well, the Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So somewhere back in eternity or somewhere back there, God put us in Christ. And therefore, Christ has become for us our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. Okay? Everybody say, I'm, I have wisdom. I have righteousness, I have sanctification, and I have redemption, all right? And God put me in Christ, and therefore Christ became wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption for us. You don't have to strive for it, just receive it and accept it by faith. That's something God did for us, okay? Now... <clears throat> This here is a little case right here. Right here is a little case. Everybody see this as a glass case when well, you put your glasses in there. <coughs> this is Adam. Everybody see Adam? This is us. When we were born, without, let's go back a little bit. 
When Adam died, no, let me stop it, I'm sorry. When Adam sinned, we were in Adam. Everybody got it? And therefore, we were in his loins. And when he produced a child, his lost condition, Adam's lost in condition, he died when he sinned. When he took of the tree of, of, uh, of good and evil, he died spiritually. He was separated from God. So all of his children, right on down to every one of us, was separated from God. We inherited it from Adam. It was passed from Adam, Cain and Abel, right on down through every human being. That lost condition followed that we inherited all that down through the years okay so what God did he killed Adam and when Adam died we died with Adam goodbye Adam see people if you as a Christian or me, if we're still identifying that we're still in Adam, we're going to act that out. Do we see that? you got to see the miracle that God did. Well, what miracle was it? He took us out of Adam, put us through the cross, put us in Christ, put us in Christ and everything that Christ experienced we are in Christ so we experience that too when Christ died on the cross where are we? we're in Christ therefore everything Christ experienced we experience because we are in Christ and who put us in Christ? God did. And Christ has become for us our wisdom, our redemption, our sanctification, and our... I missed one, didn't I? Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. All right, so everything that Christ is, we are now. So Adam was crucified, that is, we were crucified, uh, and we're no more. But God resurrected Jesus, and who was resurrected with him? We were, because we were in Christ. Everybody got that? See, you accept all this by faith now, but you can see the picture, what God did. He did it for us. How did you get in Christ? God put you in Christ. So everything that Christ went through now, we're through with Adam. Forget about Adam. Don't identify with Adam no more. You are a saint of God. God's, Christ's righteousness has been imparted to every one of us. Now this is our legal position, Okay. Forget about your bad habits. Forget about your doings, bad or good. Forget about all of that. Concentrate on what Christ did for you. All right? So everything that Christ is today, we are. Where is Christ seated at right now? At the right-hand side of the Father. Where are we? At the right-hand side of the Father. We identify now. That's our new identification. You can't do it yourself. We couldn't do it ourselves. He did it for us. It's done. It's finished. It's complete. Now that's our position in Christ. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's take it a little bit further here. And... Uh, Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. 
1 Corinthians 6, 11. We may want to back up just one. All right. Let's back up one verse. Now, Paul is making a statement here. Here's what he's saying. Nor cheats or swindlers or thieves or greedy graspers, not dr nor drunkards, nor foul mouth revivals, 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 or whatever, not revival, but that's, you know what that is, you read. And, and slanders, nor extortioners or robbers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. All right. Now, Wow. What side of the cross is that? This side. Next verse. And such some of you were once. We were once that on this side of the cross. But God did something as we accepted Christ. He put us in Christ. And now we're on this side of Calvary, and now we have a new identification with Christ, and now you have been washed, cleansed, purified by a complete atonement for sin, and made free from the guilt of sin, and you were consecrated, which set apart, hallowed, you were justified, pronounced righteous by trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God. That's our position right now. Can't get no better than that. See, that's where our minds have to be renewed because so many times our mind is still thinking about this side of the cross. Now, the word remission, the word remission means like it never happened. So whatever we have done in the past, over here in Adam, <coughs> is gone. It all died in Christ. And we died in Christ. But we were made alive in Christ. And now look what it says. We were washed all right, everybody say, I was washed, I was clean, I've been purified, I have complete atonement for sin, I am made free from guilt of sin, and I was consecrated, I was set apart, hollowed, and we were justified, pronounced righteous. Who pronounced you righteous? God. When the judge says you're free, don't argue. Just get out of the courthouse <laughs> and rejoice. <laughs> Pronounce righteous. And what did we do? We trust in the name of the Lord. We trust in what Christ did for us at Calvary. And now we are absolutely, totally free from all of that of the past. New creatures in Christ. If any man be in Christ, what? He is a new creation. Put that on the board. 2 Corinthians um, 5, I think it's 17. 1 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, how was you engrafted in Christ? God engrafted you in Christ. How many have done, ever done any, took flowers and, and uh, grafted things? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, there's different ways of doing it, okay? You, you can take um, a beautiful camellia. It has all, I mean, a big flower on it and everything. Then you can take another one that doesn't, doesn't have beautiful flowers at all, and you can cut the cutting off of that camellia and graft it into this camellia that is not doing too good. And actually, it will grow and take root, and you can pack uh, 
this type of some type of dirt around it with with a something to hold it all together um, what do you call it girls when you put over you know you can wrap it with some type of uh, wrapping or something and it'll take root and you can cut that off and plant it and when it grows it'll grow and bear fruit of that beautiful flower and not the not the flower of that old flower that wasn't pretty so that's what God did. He grafted us into Christ, and we were that old bush that didn't bloom too good, you know. Uh, we had a bloom, but you might as well say that ain't very pretty. But he grafted us into Christ, and the life in Christ now, for the life in Christ. The Bible says in uh, Romans 8, verse 2, uh, we'll get back to that just a minute, uh, uh, Charles that in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ, in Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. So we're grafted into Christ, and his life that's in us now, because we're in Christ and we're grafted into him, we're drawing his life now, and we're blooming Things like helping people, loving people, forgiving people, being kind, being merciful. The fruits of the Spirit are just flowing. You don't have to try to produce it. It just flows from the new life that you're drawing from Christ because you're rooted and grounded in Him. Now, how many sees the picture? How many don't see the picture? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> you see the picture. Now, you've got to put your faith in that. That God has done that and get the new identification in your mind and see what the Lord has done. Now, let's finish reading that. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, he is a new creation. Now, what part of us is saved? Our spirit. Our minds have to be renewed. Okay? These bodies are not saved. They're still subject to the attacks of the enemy. They're still subject to these germs that's been going around, and some of us have caught the, the stuff and been hooting and a coughing and a spitting and a, all that. I'm about spit out. How about you? <laughs> but see, we're still subject because there's still a curse on the land and these bodies have not been born again, but God promises us that one day they will be and he guarantees it by giving us his Holy Spirit. And you'll find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, the guarantee that he will give us the new body, okay? But right now we're in these bodies, and they're only going to last but a short time. And everybody said, hallelujah. <laughs> now we're not ready to cash out right now, are we? You want to stay around a little longer, right? Yeah, you got some stuff in the refrigerator you want to eat. I know, okay. <clears throat> but but, but, but you got to see what the Bible says. I don't care how, whatever, whatever. We only have a short time down here. We want to make sure now that God has grafted us in Christ and we want to be able to be, uh, to allow him, notice this, to conform us into the image of the Son of God. You know, I see preachers talking about, what is your vision? You know, church, what is your vision? Well, you know, well, my vision is to be conformed into the image of the Son of God because that's God's will. That's my vision. And I believe in and I put my faith in Him that He's doing the work in me, making me willing to do His good will. And I can't conform myself into the image of God, but by faith, I know that that's what he wants in my life, and I put my faith and trust in him, but my spirit man is a brand new creature, 
and it is growing and being conformed into the image of the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. I was saved by the power of the Holy Spirit and we'll be sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit as we put our faith in Him that He's doing it. Amen? Now, look what it says. We are new creations, a new creature. Altogether, the old previous moral and spiritual condition, which was we were lost, we were separated from God, that condition has been done away, has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. I know when I received Christ as my personal Savior, it was just like the difference between night and day. Absolutely. Now, let's go through a few scriptures here and uh, turn, if you will, 1 Corinthians 1-2. 1 Corinthians 1-2. Look at this now. Now this is Paul writing to the church. And he says, to the church, that's us, us folks, the assembly of God, which is in Corinthians, to those consecrated. Well, how did we get consecrated? God consecrated us and purified us and made us holy. Notice that. In Christ Jesus. Everybody say, I'm holy. In Christ Jesus. Let's say it again. Go ahead, say it where I can really hear it. You are? Absolutely. And how did you become holy? By God. He did it. He granted you into someone that is holy. And now you're drawing his holiness out of him. made holy in Christ, who are selected and called to be saints. God's people, together with all those who in any place call upon and give honor to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So regardless of where people are, if they've called upon the name of the Lord... They are saints. Now, saints simply means called out ones. Saints just means uh, consecrated to God, just separate, set apart. We've been set apart. We're not part of this world. Now, I want you to remember this. When you go out in this world, you're going to meet people that have, have not been born again. They on that side of the cross. And you mention God to them, and they, they get embarrassed almost. But you see, that's their condition. But that condition has passed away in us, that old condition. Now we realize we're in a new condition of being born again by the Spirit of God. And we have to get our minds set on that and start thinking about that and get off of the sin syndrome. How many know what I'm talking about? All right. So is a man thinking in his heart, so is that man. If you're thinking about your sinning all the time, that's how you're going to be. That's how you're going to feel. You're going to feel guilty, condemned, because that's all you're thinking about. I'm just an old sinner. No, you're not an old sinner. You're a saint. God, Christ died on the cross that we might be saints. Now, we've all struggled with that, haven't we? Including your pastor. But see, God is bringing the light into us now when we're beginning to see what the Lord has done. Uh, let's turn to uh, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10.10. 10. Now this is Paul. Well, this is in Hebrews. Some say Paul wrote it. Some say uh, some Hebrew, whoever, whatever, but it's the Word of God. And in accordance with this will of God, what is what according to what will we have been made holy? Notice. And in accordance with this will of God, we are struggling to make ourselves holy. Huh? How many's ever how many's done it? Huh? 
why would you struggle to make yourself holy when you're already holy? Come on, talk to me, church. Guilty. Yeah, I'm, gu I'm guilty too. Well, if I cook enough beans for my neighbor, I know I'll get holy. You can cook all the beans in the world. You ain't, no, you ain't. No, you are holy. Notice, in accordance with God's will, we have been made holy by what Christ did on the cross, consecrated and sanctified through the offering made once for all of the body of Christ Jesus of the anointing one on the cross. Done, finished, complete. Everybody say, I'm holy. I'm totally consecrated. I'm a saint. All my sins are forgiven. That's weak. I want to see the chairs rise up in this place. <laughs> Is God a liar? No, God cannot lie. I remember <laughs> Oh, I left my money at home. <laughs> I thought I'd just wake you up. <sighs> Can you walk out of this place shouting I'm a saint? Could you get on the housetop and say, Jesus made me holy? We need to get that bold. And the devil comes around. Devil, you were whipped at Calvary. I overcome you by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And I love not my life unto death, for God has made me holy. God has given me power over all the powers of the enemy, by, and nothing by any means shall hurt me. I am holy in God. Now, when the devil sees you, know you are made, you've been made holy. He's heading out of town. I have talked to so many Christians. I remember this one guy I was talking to. He, he must have gone to, he was born into church, you know. Went to church all of his life. I said, isn't it wonderful to know that you're righteous? He said, what do you mean? I said, you're righteous. I'm not righteous. Ask my wife. Listen, I don't have to ask your wife. I know what the Bible says. God is not a liar, and he's made you righteous. And you're not willing to accept it. May I say something? Okay. How much unbelief is still in us, children? Unbelief. Unbelief. You want me to preach a message on that? Hebrews, you know, I can, do, I can do that. Unbelief. Because they did not mix faith with it, it didn't do them no good. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. Hebrews 4, verse 2. For indeed we have had the glad tithing, which is the good news, the gospel of God, proclaimed to us just as truly as they, the Israelites, of old did when the good news of deliverance from bondage came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? Why? Because it was not mixed with faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
Isn't that amazing? We say, I want to please God. Well, God says, take the faith that I've given to you and believe the message that I've given to you, that what I have done for you, have faith, mix faith with, believe what I've said. That pleases God. And we've all struggled with that, haven't we? Sure, we all have. I'm not fussing, but it's time to cross over. It's time to cross over Jordan into the promised land. Ah, look what it says. Did not benefit them because it was not mixed with faith, with the learning of the entire person leaning of the uh, entire, notice that, leaning of our entire personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness. By those who heard it, neither were they united in faith with the ones like Joshua and Caleb who heard and did believe. Put that in the, in the uh, King James. It narrows it down a little bit more. <clears throat> Let's milk that just a little bit. Not fussing, but we might have a problem here while we never seem to can get uh, into the resurrected life and joy and peace and hallelujahs of God. For we which have believed do enter into that rest. See, it's a rest. We don't have to strive for our salvation. We don't have to strive to please God. Notice, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if we put our faith in what He has done, it pleases Him. He's satisfied with that. And we come into a rest. Striving for this, striving for that. I want to be the president. I want to be it on the stick. That's a dead end road. Unless God builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. He's built the house, get into it and begin to praise Him for what the Lord has done. Amen. Come on, church, don't shout me down. And He said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And we're still trying to produce the works. And it was done before the foundation of the world. God chose us before the foundation of the world to be His, to sanctify us, make us holy, and become our wisdom, our Savior, our Lord. We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Do we know what that, talks about, what that means? Everything that God has is ours. Yeah, but how can He spread? Have you ever seen the universe out there? The other day I was watching on, on the internet and it showed a little part of our galaxy and that telescope zeroed in millions of stars and it looked like sand on the seashore, just all packed together and there was millions and millions of miles in between those stars, millions of stars, millions of Earths, millions upon millions. How big is our God? And every one of those stars is, is nothing but suns. Is that right? They're suns. A star is a sun. And they got earths rotating around those suns. A earth for you, and 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 a earth for you. A earth for you, and a earth for you, and a earth for me, and a earth for you. He'll never run out of earth and never run out of suns. Why did he do that? Why? How can he? What are you that God would love you so deeply? What is man? What is woman? What is, what are we that God would love us so much? See, God is love. And love gives, love pardons, grace. You know, a lot of people are not ready for grace. 
you haven't failed enough. For those that have failed quite a bit, I know I'm saved by grace. Grace in the morning, grace in the evening, grace all through the night. It is by grace that we are saved. It's God's goodness, God's mercy to his children. You know, I don't like to say this. If I'm wrong, you can throw a rock at me. <laughs> Just make sure it's a little one. There's a lot of older sons in the church. You ever know, you ever know them? You know what I'm talking about? The oldest brother. Luke chapter 15. Have you ever met any older brothers in the church? Raise your hand. I hope you're not one of them. Remember the prodigal son? I, I'll stir your memory. You know, the, the father had an oldest son, you know. He didn't know nothing about grace. Can you imagine what the youngest son did? He took his inheritance and went out there in the world and blew it on prostitutes and partying all the time. Ended up in the hog pen. He came to his senses. He says, at my father's house, the servants have more to eat than this. And he came back home. Oh, I love, I love, I love to see the father sitting on the porch, looking out there. That's my son. But how can you love a son like that? He spent all of his money, his inheritance. He made you look bad. How can you love a son like that? How can God love a son like me? And you. God's grace. God's goodness. We've got to see his goodness. Are we ignorant of the goodness of God, not knowing that it brings us to repentance? I don't go around thinking about sin, but there's times when God deals with me, and all of a sudden I can see His, His glory. I can see in the Spirit His righteousness, His grace, His mercy, His love to me. All I can do is fall on my face and say, Oh, God, I am what I am by the grace of God. You've come to the end of yourself. There's something that, tra that, that, that takes place within the bosom of your bosom. That there's something that, that all over you. There's just something that the Holy Spirit purifies and cleanses. And, and, and just, oh, God. Whew. It's God. But in that moment of time, the illumination of the Holy Spirit shows you the creature that we are and the glory and the beauty and the majesty of God Almighty. What am I that God is mindful of me? Reaches out, runs down the road like the Father did, Greets the son and kisses him. He smelt like pigs. How many has ever smelled a pig? Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Maybe that'll soften the punch you just a little bit. <laughs> it, 
Am I coming through? Am, am I coming through? Can you, can you read my heart? Can you, can you read the spirit that's trying to bust out of this bosom and, and get us all to see the greatness and the majesty of God's love? It ain't about our goodness or our badness or whatever. It's about what the Lord has done. And as we will accept it and accept it by faith and believe it every day, because the enemy will fight this message and he will constantly bring to you remembrance, you're just an old sinner. No, you're not. No. Adam made the sinner out of us. Christ made the saint out of us. <sighs> Reach out by faith and receive it. Okay, just a little while longer, we'll let you go. Let me say this. It is one thing for sin to live in us. Think of that. Sin. It's one thing of sin living in us. And that's where, and I've been basically talking about the positional sanctification. That's our position in Christ. But then there's, there's the experimental sanctification that goes on in our life. Each day, God is working in us, making us willing to do His good pleasure. That is the experimental sanctification that we will begin to bear fruit for the glory of God. Do we understand that? And that's an ongoing sanctification. But our, our legal position is done, finished. When God sees us, He sees us holy fully sanctified, and yet there's a process of sanctification going on in the inside of us, which the Spirit of God is doing every day, and you will find yourself in certain situations, and you, that will be a, really a test to show you how much sanctification experimentally that God has done in your life, the way you handle that particular thing that maybe you don't like, or I don't like. Now, it is one thing for sin to live in us. It is another to live in sin. Did you run that through your mind? There's one thing for sin to live in us, but there's another thing for us to live in sin. Do I need to explain it? Huh? You want me to explain it? I don't see nothing happening out there. <laughs> Sin living in us would be like unforgiveness. Has anybody in here ever had unforgiveness? Raise your hand. Have you, have you ever? Sure, we all have. Yeah, we all have. Or that's, and, we, and we just keep on with that unforgiveness and let it dominate and boil up inside of us. And this is what God has to do to work in us to get that unforgiveness out of us. Okay? Now, if you refuse to let the Holy Spirit work that out of you, and then you're living each day with that unforgiveness, now you're living in the sin of unforgiveness. Do you see that? Okay. You see that, Missy? You see that? Okay. Rick, you see that? I like to see heads nod. I mean, I'm not talking about like... I'm talking about that now. <laughs> now, as far as God's concerned, we're pure, holy, righteous. But then there is... And that's our position... Okay, um, all right, I was single one day, that was my position, I was a single man, young man, single, okay, then I got married, how many of you know my position changed from a single man to a married man, okay, that's simple. Okay. Now I'm married. Now I have responsibilities towards my wife and my children. And so therefore, 
in my mind I have to change my thinking I don't run around like I used to do when I was single and stay out all night and then come in no something's I've got to use a better word something's messed up there <laughs> say you, you got to get your, your head on straight I'm married and I have certain responsibilities and God is going to hold me to that I've made vows between God and, and man and therefore I am married to my wife but I've always wanted to come home to Susan you know what I mean I couldn't wait to come home. Some of you are looking at me like, I'm telling you the truth. That's my testimony. I know, I know certain men, I've heard them talk. I'd call my wife up and say, honey, I've got to work overtime tonight. She said, well, I'll have your food ready when you come in. I say, okay, baby. Love, love, love. You know, if y'all don't understand about marriage life, talk to Susan May. We'll, we'll spend some time with you. Susan will give you a few pointers. Don't run around the house with your hair rolled up in tin cans all the time. Take them out. Look pretty every once in a while. Put some of that pretty smelling stuff on. What do you call that? Perfumey. How many love me? <laughs> and the guys at the base said, Ah, you're hand packed. No, I'm not. I'm a man of God. And I know how to treat a woman with respect. Come home. When's the last time you girls had that, huh? She staggered around the kitchen a little bit. Wow. Then you say, let's get down to the vittles now. <laughs> All right, church, love me a little bit. It's a lot of truth in what I'm saying. Whew. Mix faith with it. They had the same message as the Israelites did, but it did do them no good because they did not mix faith with it. Well, where do you get that faith? God's given to every man and woman a measure of faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. My faith is not for God to make me rich with financial things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added. That will be added as I seek God's will in my life and let him do that work in me and make me what I ought to be. And I can say with Paul, I am of what I am by the grace of God. It's the grace of God working in your life. It's the grace of God that works inside. The spirit of the living God is changing you, us from the inside out. For it is God, what? Working where? In us. And what is he doing? Making us willing to do his good pleasure. See, it's not within man. Even though we're saved, we still want to go our own way. And we get into so much trouble. But when you finally make that commitment that he is Lord, everybody say he's Lord. That means you do what he tells you to do. How many goes to work and you uh, do what you want to do at work and don't do what the boss wants you to do? How, how many does that? Hmm? There's one right there. He's a, no, you don't. You, you're your own boss. You better, do what you, you better do what the boss says. You're the boss, so you better do what the boss says. You do what the boss tells you to do. If you don't, you're out of here. Well, our Lord is our Lord. Lordship. But folks, 
I'd rather have him to lord over me than for me to lord over myself. Hello, church. All right. I want to turn to 2 Corinthians 3, and we'll end on this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the one that saved us, and he's the one that has sanctified us and is sanctifying us. But see yourself as complete, perfect. All right, the, the question is, Brother Bob, can somebody come to the point of such perfection that they would never, never sin in this life? Well, you know, Paul mentions that in Philippians. He says, I strive for the goal, but I haven't reached it. But I think we're all striving in that sense of saying, Lord, do what you can do with this vessel. May I stay on the potter's will and make me, because I know it's your will for me to be conformed into the image of the Son of God. Now, all things are possible with God. And I know many of my brethren would argue this point, and I'm not saying that uh, you can reach a point of perfection. That, that's, not, that's not what we're concerned with. That we're concerned with as we are being conformed from glory to glory, the result of that will be more will be more like Jesus. How many sees that picture? All right, let's read this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Emancipation from bondage and freedom. And verse 18, and all of us, that's us, by the way, as with unveiled face, we don't have our face veiled like Moses did. Because if our face is veiled, you're not going to see the glory. Did you know I can see the glory in people? You can too. If you're in the Spirit, you can see the glory on people's faces. Yeah. Because we continue... Notice, continue to be whole in the Word of God as in a mirror. In other words, the Word of God is like a mirror. And as we look into it, oh, right, a little dirt right there. A little jealousy. Thank you, Lord, for removing that jealousy. And we just keep reading the Word of God. And we come to another part, and it's looking like in the mirror, and, oh, my goodness, look at there. there there's some more jealousy there. Oh, well, Lord, Je thank you, Jesus. Yeah, you're removing that now. Thank you. See, that's experimental sanctification now, and you put your faith in the Holy Spirit to work that out, see. see. Uh, notice what it says. As in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. So as, the, as, as we expose ourselves to the Word of God, we're exposing ourselves to the glory of God. How many of you know if you expose yourself to the sun, it's going to have an effect on you, okay? Notice this, are constantly being transfigured into His very own image in every increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit has the responsibility to bring us all into the image of the Son of God. And we need to be aware of that. We need to realize, as far as God's concerned, it's done. It was done at Calvary. But there is the ongoing now, ongoing experimental uh, uh, of, of the working of the Holy Spirit that's working in us, making us willing to do His good pleasure. And, and then it's a delight to live for God. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to fret. You just put your faith in Him, and He does the work. And unless the Lord builds the house, 
the labors labor in vain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that our faith is in thee. What you have asked us to do, you will do the work in us as we trust and put our faith in you, Holy Spirit, to do it. We thank you that we can walk out of this place knowing that it is done, it is finished, it's complete. You look at us absolutely holy, sanctified, consecrated, and yet there is an ongoing work inside of us each day bringing us into the fruit, into the very presence, into the very image of God's Holy Son experimentally. And we give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.